much, Pastor Howell. Well, good evening. Hope you're well this evening. Thank you so much, Pastor Howell, for the opportunity to be here with y'all on your Tuesday evening service. As he mentioned, my name's Adrian. I have my beautiful family with me. Baby, I usually don't have you stand up, but you can stand up this time. And you got my wife, Tyler, Love. she's here in the front row, and my two daughters, Jasmine and Janae, you know what's coming. JJ, y'all stand up. That's Jasmine, my nine-year-old, and my five-year-old, Janae. And uh, we thank God for the opportunity that we have to travel this country and this world for the glory of God in the ministry of evangelism. I know that means a lot different things to a lot of people, but I'll tell you what it's about for us. I believe wholeheartedly and I say it in my sleep. I say everywhere I go, and that's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a proclaimer of the gospel wherever that is. Even this past Sunday we were so thankful to see as we watch people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, one man that got saved, he was there to visit his son there because that was the only time he had just come out of prison and, and he was visiting his son there at the church service and he asked the Lord to save him. The only reason he didn't get baptized afterwards is because he had his anklet on and he couldn't get it wet. <laughs> I just thank God that, you know, just being a good steward and seeing what the God, Lord Jesus Christ, can be able to do all over this country and this world. And uh, also, not only do we get travel, like I said, here in the United States, but also in Central America. We spend about three months of our calendar year over there. And so, ustedes saben español aquí. Yo estoy tratando de aprender, pero mi español es más o menos. There's some Spanish speakers in the house, I thought. Anyway, if you look at me blankly, I am speaking of an actual language. <laughs> anyway, as we just leave here, the United States also. We spend time over in Central America. We thank God for what we have the opportunity to do here and there. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great. Just a time of fellowship. People said I was energetic. I haven't met this guy. <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I was getting tired just here there, there at the co drinking coffee. But anyway, had a great time of fellowship together. And uh, I always appreciate, um, I, I, I meet people who love the ministry, but I also meet people who love the Lord of the ministry. And I believe Pastor Howell loves the Lord. And and then it trickles down and you can see I felt this love and passion to be able to work in the ministry. When I walk in, I didn't think I was going to see any familiar faces, but Brother Treadway, what a blessing. You know, I, when I heard that you were here, and then I looked out, Kristen Knowles. Wow, all the way from Abundant Life, all the way in the Bahamas. That's a blessing. We were there at both Pastor Treadway's church back in Abingdon, and then um, Pastor Knowles' church all the way in the Bahamas. What a what great memories looking all around and seeing how the Lord is continually just, I said, this is a great place to be, apparently. And so what a privilege it is for this little time I have to be with you. You know, as we get ready, I'm going to jump right into it. I guess it's kind of hard to say you don't like a, a short preacher, so we're going to kind of keep right to the point here, all right? Uh, first John is where we're going to be, First John. I know that many of you probably do not know our story, where we come from, and different things, and that's fine. I don't think that's really crucially important, but I do believe this, that if a preacher has a bias, then you better understand what that bias is, because it's only going to be fair. A bias will affect what a preacher preaches on, what things he's thinking through, and I just want to let you know my bias that comes very clearly. You will see that out of doubt will come out in preaching and that is my bias is that I believe the Bible. And I believe the Bible without reservation. And I believe the Bible that when I come to a crossroads in my life and I'm sitting here scratching my head and thinking I'm really passionate about a belief I have when the Bible says something else my friend, it's over. Conversation done. I believe the Bible. Even when it takes me to uncomfortable places and I understand. Or even uncomfortable places for me that I thought that I believe I tell you, I know it sounds trite for me to be able to say it, but I promise you, if I say something for the Word of God, I hope by His grace and His strength, you will have the spiritual maturity to be able to go to the toilet of your mind and flush it down and forget it. Because it will not help you, only the Word of God shall. And so during this time we have together, I seek to be a Bible preacher. You know, I was praying much. You know, I pray weeks on end before I come to a place. You know, as I get in time, I call each meeting that's coming up by name and ask, and ask the Lord for direction and wisdom. And as I was asked the Lord direction and wisdom, I decided, you know, I, I kind of was trying to get a feel of the church. So obviously, usually any church I go to, I'll listen to the pastor preaching. So I'll listen to a Sunday morning message, Sunday night message, the series he's going through. How does he approach the text? Listen to Tuesday nights leading up unto this point. What speakers have preached on? I desire to be a get to local church and be, you know, so many times I want to make sure I'm knowledgeable, even though the Lord may have it, that the same speaker might speak on the same thing all throughout the time, and that could be Lord's will. However, I just want to be mindful as I was coming in, and, and there's so many things, given our current status today, I mean, how could you not ignore the fact about an anxious society we live in? You know, many times we're taking all the negative things and carrying our shoulders as if they are ours, and how many times this has become a distraction, even inside of the church. You know, even, let's 
not ignore inside of our world today all the tension racially that you see across our nation. You know, even before I came here, I preached a four-day conference in a football field in Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base about the reconciling power of the gospel, reconciling us to each other. And as I stood in a football stadium at Bellevue and began preaching about the gospel and how it reconciles us, we understand that we are in some dire straits about many things happening in our world today. And even though many times my heart wants to be able to go through something that is extremely practical and for us to all understand, I definitely pray that the message can be practical, but I'm going to go at this in a different way. Now, you're not going to understand that because I know I'm speaking extremely cryptically, but um, I, I'll tell you where the Lord began working on my heart personally about what I'm going to be speaking on. If you want just broadly, Adrian, what are you speaking on about? About giving. Now, when I say giving, you're like, okay, you know what direction. No, no, look, 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 before, we, before we fill in the blanks, you know, I'll tell you, giving what the Lord began to first lay in my heart, this was years ago. And let me reiterate, let me say, and not reiterate because I haven't said it yet, but let me say, I am not saying you need to have this prayer request. It's something the Lord laid on my heart. It doesn't have to be on your heart, okay? I reiterate, it has something the Lord laid on my heart. Years ago, I was at a missions conference, and the Lord laid on my heart um, to pray that in my lifetime that I would give $1 million to missions personally. You know, that seems like pretty crazy, pretty out there, but I, got, I put a pen to paper, and I begin to pray, and I, be, and I pray for it every day. You say, you're crazy. Well, fine, that's fine. I like to ask God for big things, you know, and, and I begin to ask the Lord, Lord, help me that in my lifetime, that's my desire. I want to be a giver. I want to have a giving spirit about me wherever I go. And as I began to pray and ask the Lord those things, he began to show me things in my life. Well, if I can't, I can't trust you with a lot if I can't trust you with a little bit. <laughs> and so it began a pruning process of my life of beginning to say, do I have a giving spirit in everything that the Lord has given unto me? As soon as we say the word giving, obviously we already tie it to the wallet and begin to put those together. But I want us, as we look here in 1 John, yes, the aspect of giving and that's, that's where the, the, the principle that we're going to be looking at comes from. But I want us, as you all especially, being this local congregation and assembly, to be not a matter of having, of having a giving spirit inside of the house. Now, let me show you. Let's first talk about 1 John a little bit. All right, 1 John, um, believed to be written by the Apostle John, or you know, some, no, it doesn't explicitly say in the letter, but 2 John, 3 John, obviously, definitely has him explicitly as the author, but believed by tradition that John is the author. He was, at the time, um, pastoring, well, if it truly is that, St. John is the one inside of Ephesus doing his ministry. As he's doing this, this letter, and these other letters as well, were to be circulated all throughout the churches in Asia Minor. There was a lot that was taking place during the church. Think about it for the first century church and what they were getting used to. I know that in our time, we say, and, and if these conversations don't happen in heaven, don't worry about it, but you know, people say, when I get to heaven, boy, oh boy, I'm going to go see Moses and I'm going to say, what was it like listening to the burning bush talk? And boy, oh boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk, what was it like to see God face to face? Well, I believe that the Old Testament saints are going to be running up to you and I in heaven and being like, what was it like to have the Holy Ghost living inside you? <laughs> what was it like to have the Lord? I mean, you had Jesus. You had the resurrection power living inside of you. What was that like? I mean, I really do believe they will come and be conscious of that. And with that being the case, the first century church, as with anything else, I mean, they're navigating these new waters. And as they're navigating these new waters, the Holy Spirit living inside of them, there became some teachings that began to go a little bit more experiential than biblical and spiritual. And it began to elevate experience over that which we taught was taught in the Word of God. Not Narcissism and other things, for example. And so 1 John then attends to those certain things that were taking place. Now, as you look, though, in 1 John, I mean, you can, you, you can look at different ways to break down the book, but I think it's very clear he introduces himself, introduces it in first four verses, and then he says in verse 5, this then is the message. Well, pretty clear what the point one is going to be. He first goes into it and says, the message of this book is God is light. And then he goes through and talks about how all these different ways he's light. Then in the second half of the book, he talks about how God is love. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the verses I'm getting ready to read, I don't want you to think I'm just taking them and running away and doing something I want to do with it. He's talking and he's using a different kind of language that you do not find in many other passages of Scripture. The familial terms that he uses of like brethren. Brother, sister, my little children. 
This is family terms. He's using this on purpose because the body of Christ, think of it, I know that we've kind of removed ourselves and can read the Bible with our Western eyes, but my friend, when you got baptized, honey, what happened is many times you didn't have a family anymore, and the church was your family. The born-again believers were your crowd, so to speak. I believe that the dearest friends that you have on the planet I ought to sit in your church. <laughs> the dearest friends that you have in the world. Look, I'm not saying you don't have work buddies, but I'm saying do all of your relationships happen without the church? Because these family terms are used in relation to people in the church. Now, with that being said, let's look at these two verses. Only I'm preach on two. And as I look at these two verses together, I want us to notice something that I believe is being taught here in the Word of God. First John chapter number three. We're going to begin reading in verse number 17. The Bible says this. But whose soul hath this world's good? And see if his brother have need. And shut it up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? <laughs> My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue but in deed and in truth. Let's look at this here together. I pray that we would develop, and even if you have it in this church, I pray you do, but Paul also encourages others in other books. Paul encourages the people, like, he says, you have this, but strengthen this, continue this, this giving spirit inside the church. Let's pray as we be it started, ask the Lord's blessing upon his word. Father, I thank you for the Bible. Thank you for what you teach us. Lord, the best way I know how, I ask you to empty me of myself that I might be filled by spirit. Well, I pray, Lord, as we look into your word here tonight, Lord, there's many things people are doing on Tuesday evening, and I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, that I believe you, you, Lord, you develop schedules, you know the practicality of what goes in to sermon prep and the practicality of coming in as far as scheduling, Lord, you know all that. And so the best way we know how, Lord, I'm following your will. And so I pray that during this time, Lord, that your hand would be all over this service. Lord, I pray that you would not help me. I, I really don't want you to assist me. I, I don't want you to come alongside me. I, I pray that you would take over. Lord, I want to be your instrument. Lord, I, I just want to be able to play forth that which you have, Lord. And whatever it is, may I yield to thee. Lord, take thoughts from my mind that shouldn't be there. Bring thoughts that should. Lord, I don't want to check off a box. I don't want to just go through the motions. I desire to be your servant and the use of you. Lord, whatever it is you desire to accomplish inside of First Baptist here today, Lord, I do pray, Lord, you be able to accomplish it. May you have free liberty. And Lord, I certainly do pray. Though I have sought your face and Lord, I have prayed and asked, if there's a part of me that is not yielded to you, I I pray you bless your word in spite of me. Lord, that your word would be that which is exalted and remembered and treasured inside of our hearts. We desire your presence. Lord, it could be said better. Lord Jesus, Jesus. Lord, we, we need thee. I thank you so much for everything you've done and everything you will do. In Christ, I do certainly pray it all. Amen. You know, here's what we're quickly going to do. I am not going to give you, you know, necessarily points about this message yet. What we're going to do is just really just do an exposition of going through this passage. Now, some of you inside the house are Bible scholars, and you'll be able to jump ahead of me and know the application that is coming. However, I want us to be all on the same page and not assume things here about this passage. So we're going to slowly go through it. As we slowly go through this passage, then at the end, we'll make it and see what this is specifically for us. We'll start at the beginning where it says in verse number 17, but who soul hath this world's good. Now, so as we stop there, first off, sometimes we got to divorce from, divorce from our mind the idea of, we think to ourselves, these, he's talking to those people in church, he's talking to those in the body of Christ who have resources, who have a lot to their name. We're talking in our context here, the guy who has a house here and the house down south. You know, we're talking to the guy who has, you know, an extra car, has a, a, a summer home, what, what Whatever a situation is, we're thinking a person that has a lot of means. Now, as you go biblically and look, there's two things you see that the Bible says, you have these, let us there be content. And that is food and raiment, okay? It doesn't have a whole lot of list of things, of all these things that God somehow owes us. To the point I want to make, as we even begin to look at this, it says, whoso hath this world's good is a pretty broad 
audience, okay? It's a lot of people. You say, Adrian, I don't have that much. You know, I, I know that sometimes we do that and we live comparatively. You know, and sometimes we can't even recognize the blessings of God in our life unless he blesses us ten times more than our neighbor. And sometimes that is an unfortunate philosophy because then God could be blessing our socks off, but because we do not have as many blessings, quote unquote, physically as somebody else, we deem it as, I just ain't got that much. You know, I remember when I was sitting at a table and as I'm preaching at a play, at, at place overseas and, and these young men, they're they're in the Bible college and they're eating their breakfast. And as they go and work for the day, you know, I've never left and had this thought. As those men left for the day, I've never had in my life where when they left, they said in their mind, I believe I am eating dinner that night. Because they were getting ready to go to work. They were going to earn their keep. So they believed that they were going to have dinner. It wasn't a sure gig. And I've never thought like that. And so when I thought, and I thought to myself about how ridiculously spoiled I am, I began to look and I said, wow, you know, sometimes we might not think that we're thinking the people who have a hefty savings. No, the audience is broad. But whoso hath this world's good. Let's keep reading. And see if his brother have need. Okay. Uh, the word here, Sareo, is really interesting. It has the idea, I think it's where we get a word theater from. It's pretty obvious. But as you look at the word, it has the idea of this. It, it's not just, I saw an avenue. I look up, okay, look back down. It has the idea of contemplation. I guess if it's a hyphenated word, uh, contemplative meditation. You see, it's also used in the book of Luke when the Bible says that they saw Jesus' miracles and they then rejected Christ. That same word is used. It wasn't like they walked over and they saw Jesus. Wow, here's a blind man. Oh, I don't believe him. You believe him? No, I don't believe him. No, it has the idea of contemplation. Wow, he healed the blind man. Wow, he, he healed this guy. Wow, look how he fed 5,000. And then the idea, listen closely, is you see, and when you turn your head, you still see it. So you see a need, you can turn your head and still see it. So they saw Jesus' miracles, they turned their head and contemplated. In their mind's eye, they're thinking about, hmm, wow, he really did heal that blind man. He, no, he's not the Messiah. That is what's happening in the passage. When they saw and then rejected. So, okay, so in this context, obviously, so we got a guy who is a broad audience, a lot of people, looks out, see if his brother has a need. Not just, hmm, he needs something. No, see, turn your head, still see. Wow, my sister, my brother still has a need. Bob brings it to my mind. I see they still have a need. Keep reading. And shut it up, his bowels of compassion from him. Now, the Bible used the idea and the picture of bowels. I'm going to use a faucet, all right? Be a little bit more helpful for everybody in the house, right? So, as you do this, think of a faucet. Now, you, you, you go to a faucet, and I don't know how everybody's faucet is. Our faucet works like this inside of our trailer. It's just kind of push it up, and then the water comes out. So, so what happens is the water naturally comes out of the faucet. To be able to turn the water off, you must then make a choice to then take an action and push it down. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, so this is natural, flowing water, flowing water. Then you then oh, turn it off. So what he's saying is, there's you as a child of God. There's a natural part of God that believes with compassion towards your brother. And naturally speaking, Holy Spirit inside of you, you then want to then help your brother. So it's not just running water. We're talking a compassion from God is now being given to another person. So now, passion, compassion, compassion. And here is what the brother does. He then goes inside of his heart and he turns it off. A part of them that God gave, they turn that part off then it asked the question, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Obviously it's rhetorical, but it's shock. Hold up. You have been redeemed. You have experienced compassion on a level that we've never seen. And yet you're going to go now and see a need of your brother. Think about it. 
walk away. It says, how dwell the love of God in him? Didn't say it didn't. It's like, wow. Well, then it continues. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So again, this childlike language, this family language, he says, essentially, hey, bro, talk's cheap. Quit talking about how you love everybody, and let's see how you love everybody. Stop saying you love First Baptist and how it's the greatest church on earth. Show somebody you love somebody inside of First Baptist Church. It ought not to just be words, the Bible is saying, but in deed and in truth, okay? We went through the passage, okay? Just so we understand. I know there's many things that you can put together and stuff, but I just want to understand what's happening in 17 and 18. So really quickly, I have three little things. This is, I, you don't have to love the wording that I use right here, but it helps me think through it, okay? Number one, you have the idea, and starting in 17, you see the need. Then number two, you feel the need. And then number three is act on the need. Again, you don't like to have the word, feel the need, but just, just follow me for a moment. So number one, you have the idea of seeing the need. It's, it's this is not the idea, and this is what I want you to, inside of your head, get. It's seeing a need. Let's stop thinking just financial. Or there are people inside this room who have emotional needs. There are people inside of this room who have literal, literal mental needs. There are so many things that are happening that needs are all over this world. And what I'm saying is the reason that many times we might not be able to see a need is because sometimes we might be focused on ourselves. <laughs> and sometimes as we are focused on ourselves, it's hard then to look out and see a brother and a sister who has a need inside of the church. You see, sometimes on our way to church, here we are, here's dad as you're driving the church, it better be a good one today. He, Pastor How better give me the word. It better be good. He better feed me. That's his job. That's it. What I'm saying is, well, come on. Why don't we come to the church and how about this? As I look around and say, hey kids, when you see somebody today, I want you to go out of your way and be a blessing to somebody today. I want you to go and be an encouragement to somebody today. I want you to draw a picture for maybe somebody that you know is going through a tough time. I want you to do something to be able to help somebody else in need. So many times we think to ourselves, well, what about me? What about my needs? I'm not saying don't ignore the God's get, it's God's simple. Don't ignore yourself. But what I'm saying is understand that sometimes we will never ever be able to see the needs of others for focused on ourself listen have you seen the need of another person recently that God so struck your life circumstances with them that it's like you're able to see something so so okay so so let's take a step so you see the need and again I said the word feel but just follow me for a minute but feel the need here's what I mean by that okay God has given you a specific set of life circumstances that are unique to you as your fingerprint. Where God, everyone has a story of how they came to Christ. And do you know what's interesting? Is that you'll see needs that other people do not see inside the building. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. You see, let's, okay, for example, um, though um, the, I, I grew up, I went to a Christian school pretty much my whole life, but my mom and dad split up. And but when my mom and dad, um, my dad used to go to church, long, long story, but during that time, one thing that was never in our home was alcohol abuse. It was never inside of my home. And so, you know, for me, it's not a context of something that I struggle with. It's not something, some people can walk on visitation and be like, I know that smell. I don't do that. I don't, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so when I walk in, in different places, let's just say there's a person who comes in church, and as they're sitting in the back row, they come in and they got like bloodshot eyes or something else going on. And I look back, and I'm getting ready, I'm just, you know, saying hi to people and stuff, and I look back in the back, and I think to myself, wow, that guy might be really tired, <laughs> you know? I mean, he, like his eyes are pretty red, <laughs> you know? Now, now, hold up, there's some people in the house who have a different life story and circumstance that God has brought you from. And you will be to look at somebody else. Man, I probably know where he was last night. You're not judging, keep it inside your heart, but you know. So God gives you then, lets you see a need. Feel a need and understand what's taking place. There are some wives in here who you've been through a rocky time in your marriage. And you know what it's like for when a person might be having marital struggles, how maybe they just dart out of church really fast 
or maybe um, that quiet or you can just see it. You just have the intuition to be able to see some so you can see a need and then you can look at somebody else and feel their need. Okay. Now, the thing is, don't pretend that everybody can see and feel that same need. God has allowed you to see the need of another person inside the house. Therefore, it is now your responsibility then to act upon that need. I can tell you, my wife knows I have a list. I have a list of 10 things I hate to hear come out of human beings' mouths. I tell you, I, I do, and I just roll my every time somebody say it. it just, they're just a list of things that is, ah, ah. And here's number one, literally, number one thing I hate to hear come out of a human being's mouth. And I'll give you the context. The context is, Pastor Howe gets up maybe on a Wednesday night or whatever, and he's reading through the prayer list. And as he's reading through the prayer list, he, he's going through, oh, uh, y'all pray for, uh, uh, you know, so-and-so, they're sick, so-and-so. Uh, uh, let me also, uh, I know many of y'all know this family. Um, but, you know, sister, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, uh, they split up and actually uh, one of them has the kids and um, they moved to the southern part of the state and the, the husband moved on to Texas. And so you, um, you really pray for that family as they're really going through a time now. You pray for them. And, and then here's what happens after the service. After the service, some people get together. And here comes the statement. They get together. Yeah, yeah you hear? Yeah, that's pretty sad. I'll be praying for them. But do you know what? I saw it coming. Saw it coming, huh? Oh, so you saw the need of another person. You, God, God so equipped you that you could even have the sensitivity to even know what's happening inside of their life. And instead of baking a cake or going over into the house or trying to take the kids away so they could get a little time alone, instead of stepping in the place, the best advice you got is, I saw it coming. This is what he said. How on earth does the love of God dwell in someone like that? Where God has you sense the need of another inside the body of Christ. This is the point, baby. Yes, we're here to grow. We're here to go. We're here to do all those things. But as we heal and as we go inside here, the body of Christ, we look out one for another. As God's love has experienced, we've experienced that. We show it to another person. You know, when you act then upon the need, see, whoo. Yeah, we got time. All right, now. <laughs> Are you, I, I, I am passionate about staying in time. I'm passionate about it. So I'm going to stay in my time. <laughs> but, you know, this is, this is tough, but I sometimes wonder why is it that many times I hoard things. A vehicle, we had two vehicles. We traveled all the time. And the one vehicle that we had, we never used it. I mean, we just leave it at the house. In fact, by the time we got ready to use it, I mean, the battery was dead and had to buy a new battery. And then the Lord, what's the point? And that's when the Lord said, well, give it away. <laughs> give it to somebody in the body of Christ. And I remember as we were there, and, I, and here was the thought. And here, 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 and here let me tell you why we have three refrigerators and two microwaves that are perfectly good that are still sitting up in the garage doing nothing. Do you know why? You know why? Because I might, it might be that I don't trust God that if I ever needed another one, he would provide it. So that's why I have three of them. When actually that microwave could be used for somebody else in the body of Christ right now. Somebody, there could be a mom inside here, a single mom trying to get back on her feet, who could use that refrigerator right now. But here we go. Nah, never know, never know, never know, never know. God could have given what he's given to you for a reason. God might have put it on your wife's heart to buy a new refrigerator. Say amen, ladies. Right there. He could have put it on your heart to buy a new refrigerator so you could do something, be a blessing to somebody else. But many times, uh-uh, no, uh no. And how many times where God has truly supplied everything the body of Christ needs except for one part of the body of Christ is hoarding all the mess? So Adrian, you men, I know, I know, we're getting a little quirky, but you know, I'm just saying. We must understand this goes beyond just our finances. It's just a giving spirit altogether. Like, even coming here, I remember going to a church, this lady, she was about 50, 55 years old. It was a parent, she came here. I don't know, I don't know her whole story, but as she came inside, it's not like she was married or anything like that. She came in, sat down, and you could tell she really got herself dressed up ready for church. And she was sitting on the second row, and I remember this gentleman came over, and he was sitting behind her, and I, and I, she, the ladies kind of looked kind of solemn, and just, you know, just, you know, it's the before church look of, I'm sitting here, 
Maybe I should talk. I don't know. That little, that little beginning time. And she's sitting there. The guy comes up. He said, ma'am, he was about, I don't know, about 62 or so. He came over. Man, let me just tell you, you look really nice today. Yeah, I'll never forget that lady's face just lighting up. Just be nice. Do you know you could be somebody's greatest encouragement? Just be kind. Maybe it's not the end of the world if you don't hit down the road and catch that ball game. Maybe you could just see somebody who might need some encouragement. You know, just, this changes the dynamic of just saying, you know, and, and, and listen, this is just an example. I, I'm not saying this is the way it should be. But just, just change the example of, we have a prayer request. Um, you know, so-and-so is getting ready to have a, uh, getting ready to get married. Or so-and-so is getting ready to have a uh, baby shower or something like that. It, it turns from just saying, ah, oh, should I do something to, hey, I got Tuesday. Well, I'm, I'm coming to the house, honey. <laughs> I'm going to bring something. You know, just doing something. Just stepping up for the body of Christ. You know, seeing the need, feeling the need. Can I make one caveat? Re no, I won't. <laughs> okay, one caveat real quick, but I, I, don't wanna, I don't want that to get the thing. But, but I have one more passage for us to look at. Because I see this, this whole thing, it seems very strange on a time when we're going through so much diversion and di 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 um, so, so much, I can't even think of the word, uh, di not diversity, um, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. We're going through a lot in our world today. All right. <laughs> As we're going through all that stuff inside of the world, it seems that Adrian preach on healing, preach on this. I really do believe this is it because it takes the focus of ourselves and we begin to think about others. You know, I, it, John chapter 13, John 13, 34 and 35. It's a very, it's, it's a great, great verse, uh, verses that Jesus is saying. And I close with this because I want you to have this inside of your heart and your mind because you see the need, you feel the need, and then you act then upon that need that God then lays upon your heart. You know, as you look here in John, um, John 13, verse 34 and 35, oh, since y'all are turning there, I'll let y'all go ahead and turn there. But as you're doing this about acting upon the need, you know, I think it's one thing to say that talk, talk, as he's saying in this, is very cheap. You know, many churches, I believe I have a bus ministry here, a van ministry, that correct? You know, now again, I don't know your business, all right? I come in here, I ask the pastor, I don't nothing, right? Now, you know, trying to, you know, sometimes I see churches that have bus ministries and and I hear people say this. Oh, Brother Adrian, you got some kids coming our bus. I love all of them. Oh, I love them, love them, love them. In fact, I could hug every single one of them. Oh, my God. I could take them home, hug them sweet and sweet. There. I'll make them all peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And they're just so amazing. And I just love all of them. If, they, if I get a big old bus, bring it to my house. I bring all those children to my house. And I will show them the love of Jesus. You don't even know their name. What are you saying is this? Stop. He's saying stop. It's easier to say you love everybody as an excuse to love nobody. It's easy to talk. It's another thing to barrel down and listen to the drama of somebody's life and still choose to care. He says, stop. Let us stop loving in word. And it says, let us see the love you have for one another. What does it say in John 13, 34? It's 5, it says this, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Do you know what Jesus is saying? Do you know what? I want the world to see. The, they're they're going to see all these things by the love you show one to another. Do not put words in my mouth and do not put me in some type of camp. But let me read to you what it does not say. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know ye are my disciples. If when you go to work, you carry yourself a big old Bible, they're going to know you are a child of God. It doesn't say that. By this, they shall know that ye are my disciple. Because I tell you, when you walk out the door, you sharp as a tap, baby. Nobody is dressed just like you. Listen, I am all for man. God lays on your heart to carry your Bible. Hallelujah, carry the Bible. You ought to look right as a Christian. Hallelujah, we ought to look right. But what does he say? That they will know that ye are my disciples. Is the love you have one for another. That is the Jesus they see many times on the outside. You know, look, 
You got a lady working out and she's working her job. Let's just say she's putting her papers away or whatever it is. Unsafe co-worker comes over and she's been knowing she's been going through it. And as she's over there going through it, hey, how you doing today? You know, and, and she kind of has a smile on her face and, and going about doing her job. And she said, yeah, well, I remember your car broke down and you, and you had to, and you had to like figure out a way to get to work. You're late to work the other day. So what happened? She said, I didn't tell you. And she, that Christian's going and put us up. She said, do you know what happened actually? You know what? There was a man in our church who knows how to fix car and do you know what he did he came in he bought the parts and he put the pieces on my car and it's already ready to go and sitting right out in the parking lot and then that woman looked back and said somebody did what now? they paid for the whole thing yeah yeah it was just somebody at my church because we didn't love each other up our church we just don't go our mouths about it. we love your church what i'm saying is they look and say do you hear what happened to carol over there do you realize that just somebody inside her church just because they care just because they love just because they decided to do something what i'm saying is, that's what they see. That's what the language many times they speak. He says, just show love one to another to the body of Christ. Have I done anything kind for another person in this body in months? Have I just surprised a brother or sister to do whatever I could to be a blessing? You know, as you Take your Bibles. You can go ahead and close your Bibles. I'm getting ready to pray here. But, and actually, if, if you don't mind the musicians, if y'all, y'all can come on up, actually, wherever the musicians are, y'all can come on up. But this that you see that's written here in Scripture, I know it seems so simple. This is a practical message. I, I really want us to be able to think through. I didn't want you to walk out of here scratching your head. But, you know, I was thinking as Pastor Powell was telling me about the live stream and people who watch. You know, I, it's not, this is not something I'm trying to sell somebody to be into a club. I'm not just saying, hey, let's just, you know, make ourselves the cool club in town. I am just saying, as followers of Christ, there's something that ought to ooze out of us. And more than anything, it's the love of God that ought to ooze out of us. You know, you might be here. I don't want to, I'm not trying to sell you nothing, but I tell you what, I don't want you to look at it here and think to yourself, so, uh, this Jesus thing, you know, just some tell me about the product. This is not about a product. I, I want you to see the inside of me that what Christ has done and how awesome he's been. And every time I get a little squeeze, I want you to see, humanly speaking, what a bit of his glory has done inside of my life. And my friend, I want you to, you ought to know Jesus Christ. Yes, will he save you from your sin? Yes, will he provide a home in heaven? Yes, he will do so much more. He will give you life eternal. Romans 4, 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Yes, he will give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ if you believe on him by faith. But understand, I want, if there's been a time in your life, maybe you're even watching by live stream, that you've had people who have done horrible things to you and they were people that were part of the church. Understand Understand, that's not what God had in mind. That's not what God was intending. He's intending that the love of God that He showed for us would be shown in and through the love He showed for us will be now going through us. But understand, He has the amazing recycling program ever, exchange ever. He says, I'll take your faith and I will take your faith and I will give you my righteousness. I will give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. What's so special about them? Well, God loves you, but God hates sin, and sin will be punished. But he says, I'll give you the righteousness of my son, Jesus, who died and was buried and rose again. And if you accept my free gift of salvation, but to him that what? Worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I hope you know Christ. I hope you know Jesus who can save you from your sin. With that being said, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. And inside of here, there's so many questions I could ask. But I just want to make sure, I don't want any person to walk out of this building and say, no man cared for my soul. I don't want any person to say, Adrian, you know, I'm not sure about heaven or maybe you have a question about it. And, and maybe this message just about the love of God is something that the love of God constrains us. But I want to make sure that you understand that he wants to save you. There, don't walk, don't leave this message. Don't turn off this live stream. Don't walk out of the service and say, no one loves you. You might not have experienced love inside of your life. But let me tell you that there is somebody 
who maybe you've never spoken to, maybe you've even cursed his name, but he loves you with an everlasting, unchanging, unbiased love. His name is Jesus, and he can save you from your sin. If you're watching online, you listen on the platform you're on, message us. Maybe go to the phone number that is there if you would like to speak to somebody more about what it means to be saved. If you're inside of this room right now, I am not going to assume on a Tuesday night that every single person in the house has a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, but I will do exactly as the end of the service is called. I will give you an invitation. An invitation says this, I invite you that if you would like to know more, if you would like to place your faith in Christ, meet us in the front. We'll be happy to take a Bible and show you what it means to be saved from your sin. Listen, church, as I have spoken, those who are Christians inside the room, I know probably a little bit different kind of message. You might expect one about maybe speaking about what's taking place in our current events. But I look, as we look in the Word of God, I do believe that even though you're going to raise your eyes in just a moment and look around and see the same faces, I hope you'll see them differently. And so tonight, during this invitation, in just a moment when we stand, we're going to just say, Lord, make me a blessing. Lord, help me to have that spirit that just wants to invest, but just wants to love, just wants to care for the body of Christ. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're physically able, I ask you to stand to your feet. If you're not or it's not very comfortable, you can still be seated. But if you can, can you stand to our feet? And as that signal is called, as the piano is already planned, and as God so speaks to your heart as to come to an altar, I encourage you. I encourage just, just whatever it is, Lord, place on your heart. Maybe there's a face. Maybe there's a person that just needs some encouragement that just you can write a letter. You Maybe you know that person just loves that dessert you make so much. Well, won't you just go and tonight? It seems silly, but on the altar, just say, Lord, help me to just see these so I can go to my brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ and be able to just be a blessing. How dwell the love of God in him who experienced the love and compassion of God and don't share it with another person. Let's just pray. Maybe you're here and you're not sure of salvation. I, I don't want to ignore that. I don't want to assume otherwise. And so therefore in the front, you have people who are ready. Take a Bible and show you no fear you're ready. Let's just pray. Let's pray. we come to you. Lord, as we come to you, Lord, just know you are all powerful. All glory belongs to thee. We thank you. Lord, I pray, Lord, during this time, these moments we've been able to spend together in church, and thank you for those who have made a priority. And Lord, I pray as we walk out of here, we will understand the amazing truth of loving Jesus and loving our neighbor are inseparable. Lord, I pray that we will love the brethren. Lord, I pray we would care about those. Lord, that we would take the blinders off of our terrible situations and our things, our, our preoccupations inside of our mind, that we can set those long enough to be able to look within the body of Christ and I pray, Lord, that this church be functioning, Lord, at full throttle. Lord, will be functioning as a healthy body. Lord, doing the work, Lord, that you've called them to do and ask of them. Lord, I certainly pray, Lord, that there'll be those who would just go out of their way to encourage the brethren, who go out of their way to be a blessing. Lord, may Facebook messages not just be firing back and forth of opinions, but firing back and forth of blessings. Lord, of things, the compliments and love being shown one to another. Lord, I pray, Lord, the negativity that we so often see inside of the world, that this will be a respite. This will be a place. Lord, this will be the area to which will be a greenhouse of the love of God. I pray, Lord, we wouldn't be fuzzy about our love for the brethren. Lord, help us to not just run our mouth about it. Lord, help us to show it one to another. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be able to be a servant. Pray that you just use your word to continue to speak to hearts as only you can. For it's in Christ's name, we serve and do pray it all. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor.